And you can be seated. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm ready for the word. Then look back and say, are you sure? Because it might mean I have to do something. Come on, somebody. I'm not sure if everybody is awake yet. It was not daylight savings time. Everybody needs to wake up. Last week, I talked about hearing the voice of God. And I believe that we're in a day and an hour we need to hear the voice of God. But after hearing the voice of God, there comes a step of having vision, needing to see where we're going. Now, before I even get started, I want to somewhat give you a little bit of definition. Now, when we talk about vision, there's many different aspects to vision. If you own a company, generally you have a vision for your company. If you are a pastor, hopefully you got a vision for your church. If you are a mother or father, a spiritual leader in your home, hopefully you got a vision for your home. Once you hear the voice of God, then you put it to action by beginning to walk out your vision. We need vision. Let me say it again. We need vision. That's better. I want to make sure y'all awake. I'm not sure if everybody's awake today. Y'all look like y'all kind of having one of those rough mornings. Do we need to set in some IVs with some caffeine? God is good, amen? It's good to be in the house of God. I think I'm going to pray. I think I need to pray. I think there's some people that need some prayer. You know, this morning I felt all alone. I, I walked up front and I told Caleb, look, if there's somebody needs prayer... Please come forward. Normally, I get people to come and we pray together. Today, I felt all alone. So I think I'm going to pray for everybody. If you need prayer, raise your hand. Y'all ready? Father, in Jesus' name, we believe you. You are our God. You are our Savior. You are our Lord. You are our King. You are everything to us. And Father, you tell us in your word, we have not because we ask not, so we ask you this morning to fall upon this sanctuary, fall upon this church, fall upon me, God, as I speak. Let me say what you want me to say and not say what I need not to say. Give us the ears to hear, but give us the eyes to see. And God, let's begin to walk out the vision. God, I pray today. God, I pray for people all over the sanctuary. God, I know that we live in a real world with real problems, but you're a real God with real answers. And God, I ask you for your real answers to fall upon your people today in a supernatural way. God, I thank you right now that you're touching people all over this place. Father, as we come in agreement today, God, we lift up Don and Lisa. God, I thank you right now that you're touching Don's heart. God, I thank you that you're healing his heart. God, I thank you that he's going to return home soon. God, I thank you for touching Molly. God, I thank you for touching those who are out sick. God, I thank you for touching Sarah so she can have that baby. Father, blessings be upon her. And Father, we rejoice together in the house of God because you're here, we're here, and we come in agreement together, and we're going to have fun in the Lord. Thank you, Father, for showing up. Thank you, Father, for being here. Thank you, Father, for opening our eyes, our ears, so we can hear. And we will rejoice together. And everybody said, Amen. God is good. We were talking about, like I said last week, I talked about how we need to hear the voice of God. This morning, I want to talk about vision. Now, when I think about vision, I don't mind telling you that, to me, vision is really important. I would rather see than hear. Come on, somebody. I remember there was a time, and some of you might know this, and some of you don't know this, and at the time it happened to me, I did not know it, but it happened to me, and it scared me to death. I was on my phone, and as I'm talking on my phone, I had my phone to one side of my face, to the right ear, and I could not hear. And I took it and put it to the left side, and I could hear. I put it back to the right side, I could not hear. And so I began to freak out. So I called the ear doctor, and I said, hey, something's going on, I'm not sure what it is, I need to see you. And they said, well, he's not in his office today, he's in Manning. I don't mind driving. I ran to Manning, I wanted to find out what was going on. So I rush down to Manning, I get there, and he goes, you know what, it's not uncommon, they call it sudden hearing loss. 
And sometimes when you reach your age, things like that happen. I didn't want to hear that. Come on. I had never heard of sudden hearing loss. I wanted him to tell me that I had a big old ball in my ear that he was going to flush it out or something. But it was sudden hearing loss. And he said, look, take these steroids and take this and, you know, at a period of time, if it's going to come back, it's going to come back. If it won't come back, it ain't going to come back. Well, folks, I don't mind telling you, I wanted it to come back. And I began to pray. Took those steroids, and as days go by, each day I could hear a little bit better. And I drove my wife nuts because I was like, God, I was freaking out. Everybody, you know, pray for me. And I started calling different people, and some of the people I called had experienced it before. And the ones that I talked to, some of them said, yeah, it came back. And some of them said, no, I didn't get it back. Those I didn't want to talk to, amen? I wanted to talk to those who could hear. But, you know, as much as we enjoy hearing, I want to see. And I believe with all my heart that the church needs to have vision. As I said earlier, some of you have vision for your company, but you know what? We need vision on a personal level. And we got to hear to have vision. We hear and we walk out the vision God calls us in our life. But when we begin to walk out the vision, see, you can't lead somebody unless you can see where you're going. The Bible talks about two blind men, the blind leading the blind, they both fall in the ditch. I believe with all my heart today, if you're driving your car, have you ever drove your car down the road and your lights went out or you accidentally hit your lights out? It will freak you out when you cannot see and you're going 75 or 175, whatever you're going, amen? When you're driving down the road and your lights go out, it's not a pleasant sight. I believe with all my heart, God wants us to have lights, not only in our cars, but in our life. Because he plainly says, we, we find here King Solomon, who's one of the wisest he chose wisdom over everything, and he got everything because he had wisdom. And he says here in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keep the law, happy is he. Now, I looked here, and I began to realize that the law was really written vision from God. Come on, somebody. Because during this time, God wrote down everything they needed. If we have no vision, we crash, we die, we perish, we lose our lives. And I believe that today, more than ever before, we need to have vision for our family. Now, I'm going to speak to you on a personal level. I remember when we were in seminary, and my goal in my heart was to return back to Russia because I felt like God had really done something in my life there, and that's where God really was calling us on a mission field, was to Russia. And I remember praying around the track, and I remember crying out for God, God, give me a vision for Russia. God, give me a vision for Russia. God, I need a vision for Russia. And as I began to cry out, God, give me a vision for Russia, I felt a real, just, a, just a, 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 something in my spirit where God began to speak to me and said, how can you have a vision for a country of that size when you don't have a vision for your sons? Come on, somebody. That day, I remember praying. I said, God, give me vision for my boys. And as I pray, I, I prayed. I wrote down each one of them. I felt like God was speaking to me. And I called my wife, and we did something real biblical. We called the boys into the room. We anointed their head with oil. I read what I felt like God was telling me to write about each one of my sons. And as the years went by, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but as the years went by, every opportunity that I could, I spoke that vision into my son's life. Each one of them, God began to show me something particular about each one of them. And I'm here to tell you, and I don't have to tell you what it is, but I'm here to tell you, every one of them is walking out that vision. I believe that if you're here today and you have children, you better begin to pray for vision for your children. I believe that if you're the spiritual leader of your home, you need to pray vision for your home. Because, see, kids don't know where they're going. Come on, somebody. And if you don't give them some direction, they go in the ditch. Because, see, the world is blind. The world can't see. We need to have vision and hope. Here's what Habakkuk says. Habakkuk says in verse, chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he was saying to me. And what I shall answer when I'm approved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon the tablets, that he may run that readeth it. 
For the vision is yet for an appointed time. And you see, sometimes we think we pray and we get vision that it's going to happen right away. See, there was a time when Jesus showed up on this earth right after his crucifixion. And the Bible says in Corinthians he was seen by 500. Now, I don't know because it didn't exactly say this. But you know what? If he spoke to 500 and he told them, he told somebody to go wait in the upper room. Now, we know in Acts when they talk about the upper room, there was only 120 of them in the upper room. Now, I don't know about you, but that don't add up in math. There's 380 of them that was missing. And I believe that 380 of them missed a vision of the church today. Come on, somebody. Because in the upper room is when we got the Holy Ghost fell upon us. All of a sudden, we have the church. All these things begin to happen in the upper room. Now, listen, here's what I want to tell you today. God is not only going to speak to you, but he wants you to have vision to carry out whatever he's telling you. If we're not willing to see with our eyes and begin to carry out the vision God has for us in our life, we'll fall in a ditch. All of us need vision. See, I'm speaking to everyone in this room. You're not here today thinking, well, I'm not that important. I believe with all my heart that everyone in this room that proclaims the gospel, proclaims the name of the Lord, should have vision for the people around them. Come on, somebody. Because, see, people around them is watching. See, you're going to be an influence whether good or bad. You're going to have vision. You're going to lead people whether you know it or not. I believe we need to lead people in the right direction, and God's calling us to do that. It's never too late for our children. It's never too late for our family. It's never too late for wherever God has placed you as a ministry. Because, see, vision is somewhat a, a purpose. See, when we have vision, we have purpose. We have, people are always saying, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? Listen, the more we read God's Word, the more we begin to visualize what God wants us to do, the more we begin to fulfill our purpose. Because God has a purpose and plan for all of us in our life. Some of it is spelt out very plainly. Some of it is very clearly. And some of us, we're still looking for it today. But the more that we look, the more we find. Now, here's what Matthew says. He says here, he's talking about take up the cross and follow me. Now, Jesus said to his disciples, and you can take that word disciple, and you can put your name down. Jesus said to us, Jesus said to Bobby, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, he's, he's speaking with a very profound word here. And what he's saying here, let's just face it, some of the things he's telling us to do is not easy to do. Amen? Sometimes people think, well, you know, being a Christian is easy. Look, being a Christian is not for the faint at heart. Being a Christian is not being a sissy. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I mean it in a way that the fact is sometimes, you know what, if we're going to follow the vision God's placed in our life, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it means us to do something we're not prepared to do or, or we think we're not prepared to do and God's going to give us a way of doing it. Anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. These are people that are just self-centered. But whoever loses life for my sake will find it. Die to self. For what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what a man gain to exchange for a soul? For the Son of Man will come in his glory of his Father with his angels. And then he will reward each according to his works. Let's go back to 26 again. For what profit is it to a man, to a woman, to you, if you gain everything and lose your family? What does it profit to you if you gain everything and lose the people that God's placed around you in your life? See, God has a purpose and plan. And see, for me, this scripture became so real during this time because I was coming out of a, a scenario where the job that I had took me away from my sons and took me away from my family and took me away from the people I love. And I struggled because I was fighting to try to regain those things that I felt like I had lost. And the more I fought in an earthly way, in a, in a worldly way, the more I, could, I, I was losing ground. Until I finally said, you know what, God? Nothing ever takes you by surprise. Nothing ever takes you where you didn't know what was going to happen long before it ever happened. And when I learned to let go and say, God, I'm just going to die to myself and God, you got to do this. And when I begin to allow God to do it, then God began to give me the wisdom to fulfill the steps that I needed to take to do it. Now, what I want to do this morning is I'm going to talk about several things. And the first one is, again, 
a lot of this I'm talking about today, I believe, is apical for you on a personal level. Because on a personal level, see, today some of you cannot even visualize you leading anybody or visualize you having a vision for anybody else. You need to have the vision for yourself long before you ever have it for somebody else. Because if you cannot see it for yourself, you'll never see it for somebody else. And so begin to take this word today and just say, you know what, God? Let me apply it to my life and those that you put around me that need to see the vision, let them begin to see it so I can begin to lead. See, there are people who call themselves leaders and no one's following. They're just out for a walk. Come on, somebody. I believe that as a believer, now this is some things that I'm telling you that are convicted in my heart this morning. I believe as a body of Christ, as a born-again believer, that all of us in this room at some level, some maybe according to the standards of man, or kind of, you know, and we have to be careful with that because we really don't compare yourself to anybody else. But I promise you today, if you are a believer today and you have asked Christ in your life and you're trying to do everything God's called you to do, you are walking out a vision that other people are watching. People will see it. Now, you might not never know it. I remember one time I preached a message long, 20 years ago. I preached in a funeral, and I thought to myself, man, I, I felt like I bombed. I felt like, man, I was young, and, and it was one of my first funerals, and I thought to myself, man, I must have said some stupid stuff. I can't believe all this. A couple years later, I saw this guy, and I had to do another funeral for the same family, and this guy walks up to me and he says, you don't remember me. He said, but I was here when you preached funeral for my, whoever it was, my, my brother, my cousin, my nephew, whatever it was, several years ago. And in your message, you said something. And when I got home that night, he says, I live somewhere hours away from here. But when I got home that night, he said, I was in the shower. And he said, I fell on my knees and I gave Jesus my Lord and my life. I gave him my heart. At that night, he said, it was, it, whatever you said during that, that funeral changed my life. He said, I've been in church. I got my family in church. Now, let me tell you something. I'm telling you this because this was like several years later in a message that I thought nobody even heard. Come on, somebody. So you never know how you're going to affect somebody by speaking whatever God is telling you to speak and have vision for your life in an area that somebody else is watching today to see what you got. Because when God's in it, it always changes. It always changes. See, God is trying to get you this morning to understand that you're not walking alone. God is trying to get you this morning to understand. You might say, well, you know, I, I, I'm a good church goer. I, I, I tithe and I give and, you know, I, I'm good. I'm just sitting. Listen, people are watching you. Because I believe that we are the light of the world. I believe that just like I talked about having that car and having those headlights, visualize it where you're going because you've got lights to see. I believe that you are the light that people are driving today, and you're the light that causes them to see where they're going or needs to see where they're going. Can I get an amen? amen. Are we alive? Here's what I want to talk about for a little while. I said earlier, let's look at a personal vision, our purpose. Our vision comes. Now listen to me. Don't shout me down when I say this now. Our vision comes and our vision, really, our vision really begins when we learn to visualize what we saw. Now, let me, let me help you out with this, okay? If you're coming out of a home that had a horrible marriage, and all you saw was a horrible marriage, a horrible relationship between your mother and your father, and you marry someone who saw nothing but a horrible relationship in their home, then you get together and you wonder why you're in trouble. Now listen to me. I believe that a lot of times we begin to have vision for our lives when we begin to visualize by seeing the good or the bad. Now sometimes some bad things can turn it around for good. I've seen people come out of a bad situation and realize that's not what I wanted and turn around and done something good with it. But I believe it starts with us. Now, let me just say this on a personal level. I knew that every one of my sons at an early age wanted to get married. And I knew that they wanted to marry 
and they wanted a house because they seen a good marriage. Now, let me, let me just say this out loud. Julie and I both had very dysfunctional homes. I had a dysfunctional home. She had a dysfunctional home. When I was 22, I didn't want to get married. I didn't think I was ever going to get married. But I saw that fine piece of real estate. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I'm visualizing that now. Amen? I saw her, and I knew I'm processing, amen? I'm saying something nice. I saw something I wanted. Now, when we first got married, I mean, you're, you're honeymoon, come on. You can't keep your hands off each other. Things are great. But I thank God every day for Dr. Richard White and Pam. They were our pastors who we, was the first church we went to when we got married. And they began to show us what a real marriage was and what real family was all about. And, and would teach us. We had classes. We, did, we went to camps. We did all this kind of stuff. And we began to learn what a real marriage looked like. Now, I'm saying that because I think sometimes we need to see what something looks like before we ever can really obtain it. Now, I thought about how even Monica, when Monica took over our children's church and we began to grow like we did, the first thing I did was I sent Monica to another church that I knew was doing children's church right. It was a big church. And I sent her there because I wanted her to see what a big church, children's church looked like. Are you following me? Now, there's a scripture that I want to talk about for a moment. There was a guy by the name of Samuel. Samuel had an anointing for a king. And Samuel was told that the king was going to come out of Jesse's house. So Samuel goes to Jesse's house and tells Jesse, Jesse, one of your sons is going to be king. Now Jesse began to visualize something totally different. He began to look at all his boys that were bold and big, and they were all military guys, they were strong, and he brought them before Samuel, and Samuel goes, nope, this ain't the one. Nope, this ain't the one. He went through all his boys, and finally Samuel's thinking, man, did I miss God? And finally Jesse says, well, I got one little, one of my sons, he's out there, he's a little shepherd boy, he's out there watching the sheep. He said, well, go get him. When David walked into the room, Samuel said, that's him. See, when the world, come on, somebody, when the world sees a shepherd boy, God sees a king. Come on, somebody. See, we got to understand that sometimes God has a bigger purpose in our life than we can even see it for ourselves. But all of a sudden now, you have David, who's now anointed to be king, but he's not king yet. Saul's still king. And all of a sudden now, David is faced with a situation where his daddy says, listen, take some of these crapper, crackers and Take some of these, uh, uh, some boudin, some uh, uh, gumbo, and some crawfish etouffee, and a little turtle sauce pecan, and oh, let's stop right there, amen? Take these to your brothers in the field, so they have something to eat. Well, when he gets to the field, he hears some uncircumcised Philistine who begins to taunt, all of a sudden taunt all the Israelites, and nobody wanted to face him. He was a giant. So David says, you know what? I think I can take him. So they said, hey, look, David wants to take him. Send him to the king. The king will prepare him, put all this wardrobe on him, all this stuff on him. He goes to the king, and the king looks at David and goes, boy, listen, I know you mean well, but I'm telling you, you're not the man. This guy has been battling and fighting since he was a young boy. This guy is going to really kick your behind. And David said, you know what? When I was out watching the sheep for my daddy, a lion showed up and I took care of a lion. When I was watching the sheep from my daddy, a bear showed up, and I took care of a bear. See, sometimes we got to visualize the lion and the bear long before we ever face the giant. See, God gives us exactly what we need, exactly when we need it the most. And all of a sudden, now David's going, you know what? All I need is a slingshot. Not only did I take care of a lion and the bear,
sometimes when you walk, you struggle, you don't even know what you're walking through. Begin to visualize something that God's doing in your life to help you see where you're going. Some of you are going to be faithful. Whatever course you're on, God's got you on. Get your life in order. Get your life in order. to a place where we feel a little uncomfortable. Be free to walk in that. I like the Bible says, be faithful to walk in that. Be free to walk in freedom and say, what can I allow this to grow? What can this grow? What can I let this grow? Listen, you don't know. Look, I remember the first time when Christy and I stepped out of a car and said, hey, we're going to start a church. I said, hey, let's say something. Um, 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 I was scared to death. I didn't want to speak. and preach. I'm like, are you retarded? Are you retarded? Thank God I was very sensitive to this because I, I needed that. Brother, I said that before, I said that today. Because every step I've ever taken, even in, in, in the coffee world, I've been like, that was an introvert. Some of you think, oh, that's an introvert. Yeah, I am. I, I mean, I like my privacy. I like my books. I like being alone with God. But you know what? Sometimes God has a plan for you. God takes you from one situation and says, okay, son, I know that you don't feel comfortable now, but you know what? I want you to visualize one day you're going to do this again. See, sometimes we can't see. We're just so blind. But unless we have that vision, we perish. Here's the next thing. Vision. Vision for believers, and I'm talking about everybody in this room right now. If you're going to visualize things God has for you, you have to begin to trust in Him. I will never be complacent. See, God will never be complacent. God will never leave you. Here's what He said. He said, the wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by Him shall inherit the earth. For those cursed by Him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights Though he fall, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord of hosts is in his hand. This is the part here that I see. This is the part here that I see is very clear. And I just said this right here. When you're young, <laughs> he is ever merciful and willing to give you what you ask for. Listen, you don't even need to walk out that vision that God has to believe that without a doubt, God says, I'll never forsake you. You will never be begging bread as you pray it. Now, don't get it mixed up, because don't think you can have everything that you want. God does give us the things we want, but I promise you, God will always meet your needs. Listen, I tell you, and it's so real, and I tell this story, because it was so real to me when I was in Russia, and I was meeting these old people, walking in the marketplace, and they would literally ask me, Espanita de Jonsi, excuse me, please. A D in back number one. Clear de Jonsi. Clear de Jonsi. They were asking them for bread, and straight away I spoke to them and said, Do you see this? Do you see this? I want you to understand. This country, these people were not built on the righteousness of God. They were not built in God we trust. Come on, somebody. When you begin to understand that, listen, you might look around, you might think everything's going to hell in a handbasket, but I want you to know that this country was built on God we trust. I want you to know that in spite of everything going on, God is still in control. I want you to know that this country was started because we needed God first in our life. And unless we put God first in our life and we begin to believe that without a doubt, God says, I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. You'll never be alone. You'll never be an orphan. Listen, I'll be a father to the fatherless. I'll be a husband to the husbandless. God is in control. Thank you. 
John says this, beloved, do not believe every spirit. Can I stop right there? Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and now already here. Then he goes on to say, you are of God. We're going to still be talking about new believers and and overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world, as the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God knows us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. See, God tells us what's good for you. We need to know the spirit of truth. We need to test the spirit. Listen, folks, this is not one that's easy. Because I really had a hard time with this for a long time. Because there was many times I would see people and they were like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe in all this kind of stuff. And then I I wouldn't see any of the fruit. I wouldn't see any of the, I begin to see things that I really didn't want to see. And I begin to realize, folks, just because somebody says something does not make it so. Now, I was talking to somebody just this past week, and they were just telling me some things about their church and about their pastor, and Julie and I were looking at each other going, man, you need to run. I wanted to tell them, you need to run, because what they were saying was not lining up with God's Word. They were not filled with the love of God. They were full of more of legalistic behavior. And I'm telling you today, listen, I think today more than ever before, I say it all the time, and I'll say it again and again and again and again and again and again. Don't believe nothing I've got to say. You better read it for yourself. You need to know what the Word of God says. You need to be accountable to the Word of God. You need to know what God is saying in the world today. Listen, if we're not careful, we're here for a reason. And it pleases our flesh. And we begin to operate because we're tempted. Now, let me say something out loud because this is a spirit filled church, and I believe. This is the absolute that you're not going to shake me off of. There's some things that I won't argue about. But the absolute is without Jesus Christ and the remission of your sins, forgiveness, repentance, you're not going to heaven. And I'm going to tell you something that some of you today is probably going to leave here scratching your head. Listen, there are a lot of good people going to hell. Just because they're good don't mean they're a Christian. Just because they're good don't mean they're a believer. Listen, goodness is not salvation. Salvation is when we repent and ask Jesus Christ into our life. Therefore, we confess Christ as our Savior. We don't talk about him as some third-party man that showed up or the man upstairs or whatever. We talk about him because he's our Savior, he's our Lord, he's our King, he's our Master, he's everything. And without him, you're nothing. And I'm telling you today, don't let somebody come to you and give you this tree-hugging, bark-squeezing, whatever, liberal gospel. I'm saying some things you don't want to hear. Amen? Because we have to be careful. Because if we're not careful, we buy into the world's philosophy. The Bible even says, it says, beware of man's philosophy. Beware, because listen, men have a pretty good philosophy. 
There's some men out there that's pretty sharp and pretty smart. And I promise you, there was a time in my life that I would have probably bought into their doctrine. Man, there's some stuff on TV about a, a, a church that some people are coming out of, and I won't mention names. You probably all know what I'm talking about. Man, you think, you think to yourself, how in anybody in the world could get caught up in that? Can I tell you, there are smart people caught up in some dumb stuff. Why? Because, listen, some of this stuff is so clever until you have no argument against it, unless you know what the Word of God says. When you know what the Word of God says, then you can argue against it. But if you don't know what the Word of God says, it sounds good, sounds clever. And by debating to say no against it, it makes you look smart. against something, man, I, I remember one time I went to this meeting with a friend of mine, and I loved this guy dearly, still love him dearly, he's a pastor of another church, and, and we went to this meeting together, and he loved this guy, he thought this guy was everything, man, my spirit was just going up, I'm like, man, this guy's smart, man, and I didn't say anything, because I'm thinking I'm missing it, I'm thinking I'm missing it, I'm thinking, man, I don't want to say anything, because man, this guy's more spiritual than I am, he's probably... He's miss, I, I'm missing it. He invited this guy to his church. And I'm going to tell you, man, that guy messed up for me. He called me up crying. And I said to him, I said, dude, I love you. And I've got to confess to you. I, I didn't, I, when you told me you wanted to have this guy, I thought to myself, I'm going to have this guy in my dog pound. He said, why didn't you say something to me? I said, because I thought I was missing it. But he missed it. I'm telling you today, listen, I'm going to say something, and some of you are going to take this wrong, and that's okay. I've used this term before. But I want you to know, see this pulpit right here? I guard it. Okay? I guard it with my life. There's not going to be a person in this pulpit that can stand in this pulpit and preach to this church unless I know they're right. I've already had some big shots call me. You ever find out you got a big church, y'all want to come? I've had to call me up, and everybody's like, you wouldn't have that guy? I don't know that guy. I don't know his wife. I don't know him. Unless I know him on a personal level, I'm not going to let him sit in my pulpit. Why? Because, listen, I want to make sure I know the spirit that's speaking. Because we're speaking spirit. Come on, somebody. We're speaking spirit today. And listen, one spirit is talking to another spirit, and some spirit says something wrong, and your spirit is not in tune, or maybe, maybe you're struggling with something. Listen, how many times have you heard somebody who's going through a difficult time in their marriage, all of a sudden some speaking spirit comes and tells them what they want to hear. Next thing you know, they're living in sin or they're running off on their husband or running off without their wife. Why? Because they listened to a spirit because they, they were just so hurt and so things were going difficult in their life where they couldn't hear clear.
a heart that divides wicked imaginations, feet that is one of mischief, a false witness that lies, and he sows discord among brother and son. Keep binding them and keep them the law of the mother. Bind them, continue around thy heart, and tie them about their neck. Romans says this. Romans one twenty one says, Because that when they knew God, they glorify him not as God, neither were thankful, became but became vain in their imagination. And their foolish hearts were darkened, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Second Corinthians, my favorite, ten three says, For though the for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See, if you don't control your imagination, you'll never walk out the vision that God has for you. And see, our imagination can go crazy. All of us have experienced a time when our imagination just went one plumb wild. I tell this story, and I remember when Caleb was just a baby. Julia and Caleb had bought him a brand new car, and, and I was at work. And I got a phone call. They were in a bad accident. And they were both almost killed. Matter of fact, if you ever see the car, pictures of the car, you, would, you can't even imagine somebody even walked away from it. We had him in a car seat before car seats were even legal. Matter of fact, the state of Louisiana, they're, they're, one of their representatives called us and asked us to tell our testimony. They read in front of the, the legislator in Louisiana to pass the car seats. We, we, we helped with that because of our accident. It's been that long ago. And it, it blew me away because when I showed up, they were... Caleb was unconscious, full of blood, laying in a sheet. And I was just, I was a young daddy, and, and I was just freaking out, thinking, oh, my God, I just lost my son because he looked like he wasn't alive. And when I went into the room where Julia was, she was freaking out because she didn't see Caleb. And she's like, where's our son? And I said, it's going to be okay. I'm trying to calm her down, but she's freaking out. And so, long story short, of course, they both lived. And, but for me, I, I, man, every time I would hear an ambulance, I would freak out. And, and it, I dealt with this, and Julia can tell you, it was horrible because if she went somewhere and I was at home and I would hear an ambulance in the distance, I would get in my car and drive to where it was. And I dealt with this for a long time. I, I mean, I'm telling you, I dealt with it because every time I would hear an ambulance, I, I, I thought I lost my family. And I really had to get delivered from that because... In my mind, every ambulance represented taking away my family. Now, I'm telling you this because I want you to know that imagination can drive you crazy. Now, I'm going to say this for whatever it's worth. I remember when the boys were getting older and people were complaining about cell phones. I was glad I had a cell phone because I was able to give my boys a phone. And if they did not return home at the time they were supposed to be home, I could call them to see if they were okay. Because in my mind, if they wasn't where they should be, you go crazy. Come on, somebody, as a parent, you know what I'm talking about. But I'm here to tell you today that we have to learn to cast down all those crazy imaginations. You gotta cast anything down that does not, if it exalts itself against the things of God, you gotta shove it back. Look, as a pastor, I had to learn that when somebody attacked me, they didn't attack me, Bobby Joe, the good old boy, because the imagination of Bobby Joe would go crazy, thinking, why don't they like me? I had to realize the attack was not me, but it was attacking the God in me, in my position. And when I learned to separate the two, it helped me go to a new level. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to teach you something. I'm trying to get you to understand that if you're not careful... Look, when you call somebody and they don't pick up, you'll immediately go to a place where, oh, they don't want to talk to me. They don't like me. They, they, they're mad at me. Oh, my God. Then you go on Facebook and you start ranting. I'm telling you, there's some crazy people out there, man. I've seen some, I'm not a Facebook guy, but I've heard stuff of my wife tell me. said, man, this person is going off. What are they saying? Man, they're just going off. And I'm thinking, why are they doing that? 
because they let their imagination go crazy with them. And I've seen it. But I'm telling you today that we have to take our imagination and get it delivered. Come on, somebody. We've got to learn to allow God, because the Bible talks about the renewing of the mind, and that's all part of the imagination. If we don't renew the mind and put on the mind of Christ, then every time something goes wrong, we go to this place where we imagine the worst. Can I tell you there are people that are in divorce court today because of imagination? There are people today that, that imagine their spouse cheating on them so much until they say it so much, and the poor person is not cheating on them, but they imagine that he is. Finally, they do. I'm telling you today, you've got to learn to bring it into captivity and let God be God. Here's the last couple here. I'm trying to close this thing up. Bring it to a landing any minute now. Amen. We're flying in. Your vision is controlled and can go only as far as your last obedience. Disobedience can and will derail your vision. Obedience, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, it talks about the blessings. This is now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command your day, that the Lord your God will get you high above the nations of the earth, and all these people, all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessings shall be in the city, and blessings shall be in the country. But here's the opposite. 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statue, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Curses shall be in the city and curses shall be in the country. Even Solomon talks about in Samuel, it says, Obedience is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of the ram, for rebellion is of the sin of witchcraft. Now, obedience is where we find, when, when you begin to, there's so many steps. And I talked about last week, hearing the voice of God. When we begin to hear the voice of God and we begin to have the vision where God's wanting to take us, our vision will only take us as far as our obedience. Come on. Because if we're not willing to be obedient, then our vision will be dis disrailed, just totally taken off, derailed, taken off a track. If we don't walk in the obedience of God, then we can't walk out the vision of God. And the obedience of God is something that we got to know because of what the Word says. And I'm here to tell you again that God is not going to take His Word and change it for you. You're not that special. We're not that special. God is not going to say, you know what, I meant this for, for Roe and, man, for Julia and Kevin. I, I meant, but, but for Bobby, you're good. I wish that was true. Next time I get pulled over by a cop and I'm, I'm speeding, I'm going, that was for everybody else. That wasn't for me. He's going to go like, Ch -ch -ch, come go with me. <laughs> See, we got to walk in. Our, our obedience will take us to our vision. Disobedience will disrail you, derail you. You know what I'm saying. Here's the last thing. I'm going to bring it to landing right here. I know you're glad. Amen. Can I get an amen? Vision from the Lord comes from following God, not man. Got to follow God. And God uses man. But you better know that it's God. Because man makes mistakes. Colossians 3.22 says this, Bind servant, obey in all things your master according to the flesh, not, a, not with eye service. As men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God, that's the beginning of wisdom. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. God is not a respecter of persons. Do it unto the Lord, not unto man. I shared something in the first service, and it's no one here, so don't think I'm talking about somebody in the place today. This was a long time ago, 
and they're not here anymore. But I remember one time we were doing some stuff, and this particular person said, and she said it. And when she said it, I, I could see my wife's face go, whoop. But she said, I want to do it so people will see me. And I thought to myself, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it was something that I consider sacred. But I thought when she said that, I immediately began to think, you're not there for the right reasons. And I found out later she wasn't there for the right reasons. I'm saying that because when we walk out the vision of God, we didn't need to know we need to need to, we need to know that it's God. It's not man. See, if I if I came here, you you'll find that I, I have a difficult time preaching about certain things. Because in the light of eternity, some of these things that some people get so hung up on, to me don't mean a hill of beans. Sometimes I think that if I get up and start preaching a particular sin or a particular something that you might think is sin, you might not do it as long as you're here or you're around me. I want you to be convicted of something because it's God. Not because of me, not because of man, not because of somebody else. I'm not saying that we can't learn and people can't teach us, and I, and I will, and there's certain things that I, that I feel led to say, I will say. But I grew up in a church that, man, it gave us all the don'ts, no do's. I, I, I was in a, just recently somewhere, and there was a pastor that pastored this particular church for a long time. It's not here in the city. It's, some of you don't even know where it's at. But I was around some pastors, and they were talking about this pastor who had pastored this church for like 30 years. And he had passed away. And I immediately thought, well, he's gonna, they're going to have the funeral at the church because this guy pastored this church for 30 years. And the guy said, no, they won't let him have the, the service there. And I said, why? Because they want somebody to sing a song, and the guy who sings, sings off a cassette. And this guy preached against people singing off of cassettes because he didn't know where this cassette, the, per the person that played on the cassette was the night before. Now, I know, I know you're looking at me thinking that's stupid. I thought it was stupid too. I don't mind telling you. I thought it was just asinine. And the guy literally had to do the funeral in a, in a, in a funeral home because the new pastor would not let the guy who they want to sing, sing because, oh, he can sing, but he got to sing from the piano. And he didn't play the piano, so he was going to be in trouble. Now, you look at me and you think, that's stupid. I'm telling you today, there are some people that get hung up on some stupid stuff. And I thought to myself, they're not going to let this guy who, this church grew to where it is today because of this guy. They're going to put him in a cold funeral home, impersonal, because this guy won't let this guy sing. Now, you look at me like that didn't happen. It happened. I'm telling you today, there are some things in the light of eternity that don't matter. There's some things that you're not going to shake me off of that matters. But that, I better just leave it alone. <laughs> God has a purpose and vision for you in your life. I wouldn't have preached this message unless he does. You might be a new father, new mother. You might be brand new, married. Listen, I'm telling you today that if you don't have a vision for your family, things are going to fall apart. I've seen people that get out of fellowship, out of church, out of different things because they have no vision. And next thing you know, they're running around like a chicken with their head cut off. And they wonder why they're in trouble. 
I'm telling you today that God has a purpose for us to hear his voice and to have vision and purpose for our lives. Father, I thank you this morning. I hope that I said what I was supposed to say and didn't say what I wasn't supposed to say. And God, I pray today for every man, woman, and child in this place. God, my prayer today is the hearts of every man, woman, and child will hear this voice and know without a doubt they're hearing from God. Heads bowed, eyes closed. This is what I want to pray for this morning. If you're here this morning, you might simply say, Pastor, I have struggled with vision. I have struggled with purpose for myself, for my family, for whatever God is letting you lead. And all you're asking me today, I'm not asking, is there trouble? I'm just saying today that I want to come in agreement with you that God will be very clear on your vision and in your purpose. If you say today, Pastor, that's an area of my life that I just need prayer. Would you pray for me? That's what I want to do. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, pray for me for vision and purpose. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you this morning, right where you're at, just slip up your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you. By the anointing of the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us to all truth. Holy Spirit, this morning I ask you to speak to the hearts of every man, woman, and child that raised their hand, and maybe perhaps those who had a difficult time that couldn't raise their hand. God, whatever they need, you're a God that will provide, has provided. You said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. I believe that. God, I pray today that they will have vision and hope and purpose and plan for their future, for their home, for their life. God, I pray today that it will be more clear than ever before. I pray that you'll begin to give them direction. And God, I will thank you for that. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you came today and maybe you said to me or, Pastor, I realize today for the first time I am lost in need of a Savior. Or maybe you showed up today and you might even say, Pastor, there's been a time in my life that I was serving the Lord, but I realize today that I am backslidden. And I want to get that right. Between you and God, the Father from the heart, right where you're at, just simply pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart today. Jesus, I make you my Lord and my Savior, my Master, my King. Jesus, save me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, thank you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you prayed that this morning for the first time, or maybe it's a prayer rededication. It doesn't matter. I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But if you prayed that prayer this morning, right where you at, just slip up your hand, put it up, put it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. God, I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for everything you've done thus far. And God, I look forward to what you're about to do. Your blessings are in our tomorrows. Use us this week in a mighty way as we honor you with our first fruit. And all that we say and do, we give unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you receive that...